Welcome back to Wombology Day 2. It is Championship Sunday. The second game of our top eight with Callum and Subtle. This is a really exciting one. It's your teammate, Subtle Rising, against uh, Orange, a friend of mine. Really excited to see these two players who, uh, I have to say, not necessarily would be favourites to take the tournament. So if either of them were able to, to go deep in this, I would call it something of a, of a Cinderella story. And even Ryzen getting this far, beating Show in our round of 16 yesterday, in one of his uh, very limited competitive appearances, was uh, very impressive. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how I feel about you selling my complexity boys short here, Callum. But no, I, honestly, I'd agree with you. Obviously, it, it was an upset for Ryzen. Like I said, he is more more known as a streamer at this point than he is as a, as a competitive player. But is a very strong player in his own right. Um, so no surprise to me to see him go through. But as you said, these these might not be uh, two of the names that people are, are looking out for to potentially win the tournament, but. Orange has kind of made a career for himself out of being slept on a little bit and just going through and taking down these huge majors that are, are stacked up with players when no one really has his name on the list to do it. Yeah, what I really love about Orange is that he's, he's such a, a swingy player and he'll win majors and then bomb out of majors in like successive weeks. When he won his first major in, Cata in Catavice, uh, Catavice or whatever you want to call it, you'll have, you have to learn this now you're going there to cast. It's Catavice, I believe. Catavice, yeah. okay, yeah. sure. Uh, you know, he won his first major, then got signed to Archon, went to the Viagame House Cup, and lost in groups. And I think a lot of people at that point instantly wrote him off again as, oh, well, you know, clearly a one-hit wonder. But then, like, two weeks later, he goes and wins Seat Story Cup. Right. And becomes only the second person ever to win two 20k tournaments. Yep. Uh, following on from from uh, from Calento there, and Firebat has now joined that club, I believe. Uh, but he was the second person to do it. And then, of course, has won other tournaments as well, won the, uh, the Abios Grand Tournament that you cast. Yep. So certainly not a player that uh, can be completely counted out. We see the, the picks and bans here. Mm -hmm. I do want to point out this is still the same person, Ryzen, that we saw yesterday. You might not, <laughs> might not recognize him if you watched our broadcast yesterday. Yeah, you know, yesterday he was he was just casual and chill. He was seeing how it went. But now that he's in the top eight, it's business Ryzen now. Like He is he is here to, to take some names. Yeah, it looks like he's, uh, you know, like yesterday it looked like he was headed for a rap battle. Today it looks like he's headed to work at some IT company or something. Yeah, but just looking at the bands, so Ryzen has had his warrior band out and Orange has had his mage band out. So the potential of that being a freeze mage, obviously the warrior is a natural band pick, but Ryzen has countered that by um, getting rid of the freeze mage. But um, as you pointed out, we were discussing this a little bit in the break. There is also a potential patron warrior and a rogue in Orange's lineup. So banning the warrior just makes a lot of sense here anyway. Yeah, even if, you know, worst case scenario, you're, it's a control warrior, which is a natural counter to the patron warrior. Yeah. There's also the potential for it to be a more control orientated patron warrior. You know, some patron warriors do run things like shield blocks or uh, sludge belchers. Yeah, the, the, cause some problems. shield blocks getting a little bit rare, but there's also, particularly in tournament meta, there's a habit for people to tech in a Harrison to their patron so that they can right. win the mirror. So that kind of thing's a possibility. But yeah, the warrior seems like a sensible ban because... If it's a control warrior, then it's probably good against your rogue and your mage. If it's a patron warrior, then it's really good against your paladin. So um, it makes a lot of sense to get rid of the warrior. Did we did we see Ryzen's warrior yesterday? Do we have the information? I think it was, was a, a uh, lot of games. It was patron. I, I believe think. it was patron. That was what I was leaning towards. So yeah, the... I, I talked about his, uh, his his in previous tournaments not having had his warrior high enough on EU right. to, to play it. Yeah, that's um, right. Obviously things have changed for him now. Yeah, uh, so. The Rogue, Druid and Paladin available for Ryzen. What do you think is the logic behind the Freeze Mage ban? Um, obviously effective against the Paladin, effective against the Rogue. Um, the Patron Warrior is fine against it, but nowhere near as destructive against it as a, a Control Warrior would be. Um, so he only really has the druid and sort of an okay matchup with the warrior to counteract that that mage. So if one of those gets banned from orange, which of course is what's turned out to happen, then the mage becomes a definite strong point for orange. So I can get on board with banning that out here for sure. So fairly even uh, ban and pick phase here, you would think. I think so. They both, yeah. both made looks like they've made smart ban decisions that have lined up well for at least two of their decks. Yeah. Uh, so pretty pretty even heading into this matchup then. Yeah, I think maybe the, the Secret Paladin of Orange might give him a bit of an advantage because there isn't a, a huge counter of it from Ryzen. The Rogue is his best chance. Rogue has a slightly favorable matchup, but it does rely on the right things lining up at the right time. It's not, it's not a hugely consistent counter. 
Um, but you know, Orange still having his warrior available to go into the, the Secret Paladin is potentially strong, and then he also has that rogue as a backup plan. So I can see the, the Secret Paladin from Orange potentially doing some work the way this is lined up, and Orange seems to agree he's going to choose to lead out with it here. Yeah, it's just what I was going to say. You know, you mentioned that Rogue Paladin game you were talking about it, and lo and behold, that's what we're going to get. The backstab is a, a pretty big pickup for Ryzen here. It does allow him to potentially deal with a, a shielded minibot quite well. Yep, uh, Phantom Knives is also a really good utility card to have early against the threat of muster for battle, but you don't want to have this mulligan with Rogue where you keep too many answers in your opening hand because you really do need to pick up some minions to be able to fight for the board effectively as well. But uh, Ryzen is just going to be happy knowing that he has a couple of solid answers to the, the first few things that the Paladin will look to do. We can see that Orange has gone full scumbag here with the full golden secret Paladin. Yep. It's, uh, yeah, I'm not really sure what to think about that. Yeah, I mean, we're getting to the point in Hearthstone now where like the real top players have played the game enough where they, they do have that full golden collection thing going on, at least for all the relevant playable cards. So we're starting to see uh, the golden coin meta come into play here a lot more, Callum, than we used to. It's, it's golden coin meta. Yeah. You know, if you know if your opponent plays the golden coin, well, you might as well go ahead and concede just there because you, know, <laughs> you know that you're up against a, a true role player. Yeah. You know how, like, um, golden Dr. Boom, the boom bots always roll four, and Golden Animal Companion always roll tougher. The golden coin actually gives you two mana. It's a very, very little known fact about it. Oh, golden. well, uh, Orange chooses to float one there, going for the Shredder, which is yeah. interesting, but, you know, he's, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty good card, so I think we can let him off. Um, Ryzen getting in a prep sprint here, which seems to be a, a pretty solid play. Doesn't Didn't have the minions, but has picked a couple up, and wasn't... Okay, the Shredder is a, you know, a threatening minion, but hadn't taken a huge amount of damage in the early game. Yeah, he now has a huge potential for a Violet tw Teacher swing turn some point in the future. He can already next turn with five mana, do Violet Teacher, Deadly Poison, Prep Blade Flurry for a huge board swing, but looks like the board isn't going to be quite appropriate for that. He might choose to go for something along those lines anyway, just for the huge uh, tempo swing it represents on the board with the Violet Teacher. Was there a consideration from Orange of maybe trading the Shredder first and then playing the Cog Hammer? So you protect, so you it's whether you value the 4-3 stats of the Shredder over the Divine Shield. And I think in this situation you definitely do, because there's a Rogue Dagger up. So just having a Divine Shield up on a minion, it's going to get the least possible value that a Divine Shield can get, which is just soaking up one damage. And it's yeah. one damage for zero mana as well, because the Dagger is already sat there. So definitely like keeping the stats on board. No, no, no real need for a Divine Shield right now. Yep, just a little consideration you have to, you know, there are, there are some decisions to be made in Secret Paladin sometimes. Oh yeah. I just want to, you know, you got to highlight them when you can as a caster. Or, uh, That's or nice. Just, the deck is on autopilot. You got to do your job, Callum. You're here to ask questions. I'll tell you when they're stupid. Don't worry. Exactly. That, it is my job to ask the stupid questions. Yeah. Don't worry. I have lots. <laughs> <laughs> so he's going to go ahead and load up his orange, the deadly poison here, just to um, it's make. Ryzen. Uh, so yeah, it's Ryzen to load up the deadly poison here, just to potentially buff up the the blade flurry in a in a following turn. He can now do Violet Teacher Blade Flurry without having to use the preparation, keep that preparation for a further swing later with the Azir Drake if he needs it. So he's just giving himself a lot of flexibility here as to how he spends his mana over the next couple of turns, um, especially with the, the threat of Mysterious Challenger in the near future, even though he only hits that poison on a one charge dagger. Yeah, I like not attacking into the Shredder here because there's obviously a pretty good chance that what comes out of the Shredder can just trade with your Shredder. Something like that, for example. And uh, yeah, you give yourself more flexibility. Hmm. That's a card. It is a card, but for all intents and purposes, it's pretty much dead for a turn because he's not going to hear a power next turn. He's playing that, that big boy six mana card that he has in his hand right now. True, but if it does manage to stay alive, and I think, yeah, Ryzen is going to have to respect it a little bit because if the Avenge were to hit on that and yeah. then you can use it the next turn, that's a lot of damage. That's yeah, a big pile of stats if it gets hit by an Avenge for sure, but... Ryzen does find the swing turn here with the Violet Teacher timed perfectly. Now, if you're yeah. struggling to, to beat Secret Paladin, this is what you need to do. You need to time your swing turn, whatever tempo play you have in your deck, make sure you make it the turn before they want a challenger. Because then they, they're unable to react to their board. They have to just load up their big 6-6 six, six on the board. It's going to be their best play either way. And you get this strong position where you have a powerful minion consolidated on the board. Ryzen just giving a little nod like yeah of course that's what he played of course he played the mysterious challenger yeah and uh looks very chilled does Ryzen very laid-back player literally 
Yeah, the Mysterious Challenger, we talked about this yesterday. Challenger does work better when you have minions on the board and being able to clear your opponent's board just before they play Challenger does diminish the potential damage from it. Yeah, more than that, it's, it's about getting something that's uh, usually a must-kill threat for your opponent onto the board before the Challenger turns. So you think about Grim Patron, turn 5, Death Bite in a Rage, making a bunch of patrons. Normally when you do that, your opponent's next turn is locked up with the fact that they have to try and address your board in some way. Um, but in this situation, of course, you know what the Paladin's going to do on turn 6. So you can take advantage of that fact by getting your free turn to develop your power minions like your Violet Teachers, like your Grim Patrons, etc. and get long-term value out. Just trying to think what Ryzen can do here to clear the board. If he had picked up a Sap, he would have been able to deal with this almost perfectly. But uh, as it is, I think he's going to go ahead and prep the first time of knives. Yeah, it means he can still hit the Sap if he draws it. Um, so I still cast the Sap if he draws it, but... No such luck. Uh, Sap doesn't come out to play just yet, but hopefully he's able to get, or hopefully for his sake, he's able to get one in time for at least that Tyrion bordering if he's not threatening lethal damage before then. Yep, Competitive Spirit doesn't go off because it's still in hand for Orange, so only one Competitive Spirit, which is pretty standard. Uh, so it's just a 9 6 rather than a 10 7. And yeah, only a 9 6. Yeah, only a 9 6. Yeah. yeah, you're right, Ryzen is really threatening here if he can pick up something like a Blade Flurry. Like a I see something like a blade flurry. Exactly blade yes. flurry. <laughs> something like exactly a card is a <laughs> is a it's a trap that a lot of casters fall into saying because it just it's more words, right? So it's, it's more words, and also there's this hesitation while casting to um, you know commit wholeheartedly to something in case oh, you're there's wrong. Flurry. There is something like a blade flurry, Callum, and something like a blade flurry turns out to be quite effective here, but. Unfortunately, in this situation, Fan of Knives is something quite like a Blade Flurry. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> oh, and the Ancient Watcher. That, it feels bad for Orange. You can see yeah. he's not happy about that. And that is a zero-value competitive spirit. Sure. There is no situation no. where that gets value, because if you silence the Watcher to get it to attack, you're going to lose that buff anyway, so... That yeah, unless he's got a teched in Defender of Argus. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That is the worst possible scenario for a competitive spirit to go off, but he does have the Tyrion follow-up on curve, and Ryzen now is just kind of looking at his hand, like, how have I not drawn a sap yet? What's going on this game? Yeah, I mean, he can sprint into the sap here. Yeah. Uh, and, I mean, looking at the size of his deck, we don't see the number, but I'm pretty sure, if, especially if he's playing two, we don't know whether he's playing two or one, but if he's playing two, I'd put good money on him hitting the sap with the sprint here. Yeah, he's already... Um prep sprinted once he's cast fan of knives twice and i believe that's the mm. second drake that's on yeah. the board as well so he's cycled a great deal of his deck right now so the chance of hitting sap is very very likely if he's um is playing too as you mentioned oh it looks like he's fooling the sludge belcher here not believing in the heart of the cards to give him what he needs so he's going to use the eviscerate here and uh, the he's going to face tank the six damage looks like he's going to face tank the six yeah Guarantees to push the extra force space, gets the Belcher on board, threatening lethal with that oil in hand. I like this too. He still has plenty of health to play with. Um, as I've mentioned before, um, what, the strange thing about Secret Paladin, although it's a very aggressive deck, is once you can remove their board, they don't really threaten damage anymore. Yeah. The, the best thing they have is a weapon plus possibly Concentrate in, in, for, in the form of burst damage. So, uh, if you're able to control the board, you can actually you know navigate yourself down as maybe a Rogue or a Warlock to a very, very low health total and still feel pretty comfortable. Yeah, can we can we talk about the playing of the Avenge when you've got an Ancient Watcher on board? I mean, <laughs> Orange just has to do it, obviously, and, you know, he has nothing else to do with his turn, but I, I feel like the way Orange's luck has gone in this game, it's going to hit the Watcher, right? That's what's going to happen. This is... not... Uh, I'm a bit confused here. He could have. Oh, it is still legal. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, flurry, Unless yeah, the event gets... hits the slime, which doesn't matter anyway, the yeah. flurry will still clear it out. It's just interesting because he could have played the Van Cleef first to combo the Tinker's Oil and get the the plus four on board as well. Yeah. Um. So yeah, he tried to do it the hard way, but still, still good enough for lethal in the end. Well, Ryzen jumped out to an early lead here, one to zero with the rogue over the Secret Paladin. Actually, we were talking in the pre-match about how the Secret Paladin of Orange 
could well run the table in this match and that the rogue was Ryzen's only counter. It wasn't necessarily a great counter. So this is a huge win for him. Yeah, and we've talked about kind of the, the mind games that go into Last Hero Standing. I think that first game that we saw come up was fairly predictable. And because it was fairly predictable, that ended up working in the favor of Ryzen because Ryzen predicts, you know, okay, I may be overanalyzing this and there's a chance that Ryzen just went, I really like playing Rogue. I'm a Rogue player. I'm going to pick Rogue. But there's also the chance Rogue that... player sounds a lot like Rogue player. It does, yeah. I'm aware of that. Um, there's also the chance that he saw the way the match was going and saw that the Secret Paladin was a huge threat against a lot of his lineup and that because of that, Orange would intend to lead with it and then picked his best possible counter deck to go up against it game one and eliminate it straight away. So if that's the case, then well done to Ryzen. He's got himself an advantage. But like I said, he is he is a well-known rogue player. He is, has high mastery of rogue with a G in it, Callum. And uh, so, yeah, no surprise if he just went with it there as a comfort pick as well. Well, Orange, who is also uh, considers himself something of a rogue player, is going to go ahead and pick into that mirror match rather than the uh, the warrior. Hmm, interesting. Um, I don't, I don't mind uh, patron into into rogue. It's usually a matchup I'm quite happy to play, but orange obviously feels like he's about to display some rogue mastery of his own here. No respect for the uh, the well established rogue player, and he's just going to try and take down Ryzen in the mirror. Absolutely. The way we're saying rogue player now reminds me of uh, casting with Lothar and having to pronounce cog hammer, mm -hmm. which is always a. Uh... Always one you've got to be careful of. Yeah, you've got to be very, very careful that you make those those hard consonant sounds. Hog. Yeah. Hammer, because yeah. you know, don't want to say cock hammer, because then Twitch chat would get all excited. Wow. If I was if I was to say cock hammer. Wow. Just pandering to the crowd now, Callum. <laughs> That's what it's come to, is it? What can I say? Yeah. I got I got to make them love me somehow. Yeah. Cock jokes. That's that's the way to go. That's all I've got. <laughs> just, I've got nothing else to offer. All right. Fair the enough. Twitch chat, I, I'm, Twitch chat isn't buying anything else I'm selling. No, so. right, that's fair. You've got to find your niche, Callum, and if, if that's it, then that's what we'll go with. Please let that not be my niche. <laughs> hey, I didn't make you do it. I didn't, put gun, <laughs> I didn't put a gun to your head and make you say cock hammer three times. Okay. Well, you, yeah, you didn't make me say cock hammer. You're right. All right, that's. Uh, I think we're done. I think that's enough. Let's move on. Yeah. All right. So sort all these hands. Double prep on either side. Well, double preps, one on either side. Yes. The, the early Thalnos for Orange as well. Shredder and Drake and Belcher picked up for... Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah. It looks like they both kept the preparation. May have just been right. a spectator mode thing there going on. But I was going to say, I, I think you pretty much always keep preparation in just, like, almost every matchup, but for sure in the Rogue Mirror. Okay, well, backstab for, Ryzen, for Orange sorry as well. Yeah. him to deal with any uh, early minions, but Ryzen only has those mid-range minions, so I think that backstab might be staying in hand for a little while. Yeah, he does have Blood Mage backstab though to potentially um, snipe down the first part of a Shredder if it comes down to that. Obviously, spell power backstab, one of the most powerful things in the Rogue deck. As we've talked before about zero mana cards and their effect when we were talking about the living roots getting discounted, but zero mana cards that have a reasonable effect on the game almost always get included in your deck. We're talking about things like Backstab, Innovate, um, even Arcane Blast essentially is included in Tempo Mage because of the fact that it can be a, a, a non-situational backstab with the use of Sorcerer's Apprentice. You get to use it for zero mana to do two damage whenever the hell you want whether the minion's damaged or not. So the, the idea of a, a zero mana effect, an effect that has no impact on your overall tempo of the turn is just hugely powerful in Hearthstone. And Orange actually decides that he needs to cycle right now, decides to dump that Blood Mage and gives up his uh, Blood Mage backstab combo for the Shredder. Yeah, that's just what I was going to say. What, what, do you, what do you think of that decision there, not keeping the combo to deal with the potential Shredder? I mean, it's, it's fine. Um, he's he's valuing the cycle over taking four damage to face, which is what he would have had to have done if he was going to answer the Shredder. So he can still Violet Teacher backstab and hit the Shredder. So all it is is he's taking four damage. And he now, having picked up the Deadly Poison, has the potential to go in even deeper than that. Yeah, he could prep the poison as well. Yeah, he could vi board. Violet Teacher, Deadly Poison... Well, sorry, Violet Teacher prep Deadly Poison and then try and backstab the Shredder outcome. But yeah, this is the alternate line, which is just prep, sprint, get the resource advantage, try and catch up on tempo later with the Violet Teacher. Yeah, you can still backstab if you want here to, to clear this Shredder, but... Yeah, not... With Double Should Teacher in hand, it seems unlikely. Yeah. So what do we have here from Ryzen? Can't really do a whole lot of anything here. 
could poison SI7 face if he wants. Yeah. It doesn't feel like a good option. I think this is going to be just a pass turn here from Ryzen. It doesn't feel good, but Ryzen may be accepting in this situation after seeing the prep sprint come down from Orange that he's now the aggro in this matchup and that Orange has got the resource advantage and will probably win a long game. So the, the Deadly Poison SI7 Agent phase play does represent the most power on the board. It puts him the furthest ahead on tempo. Um, it's unlikely that either of those cards will be able to be used on the following turn. He's going to hold on to the Deadly Poison, but again, it's going to be a while before that thing gets floated in, because he probably wants to play a 5-drop next turn. As a Drake backstab looks like a potentially powerful option if a, a piloted Shredder were to come down, for example, or a, a Drake that he can finish off with his dagger. So. And Ryzen with all the options in the world here, really, and the Violet Teacher still looks pretty attractive. Uh, I would think that's what he's going to go for here, unless he can maybe look at some shenanigans with the SI7, but he might disagree and go for the, the Shredder. Interesting that he does look like he's going Shredder here. This is obviously going to be a, a nice target for the Azure Drake backstab that I talked about last turn, but... Yeah, it seems interesting that he's casting the uh, Deadly Poison here, choosing not to get the value out of the Violet Teacher. Of course, the dagger is up from the rogue that can immediately deal with that 1-1, but the Violet Teacher is a nice shape to be competitive against a Pilot Shredder in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. It's the same thing we talked about yesterday with uh, Water Elemental lining up into Shredder. The Violet Teacher does kind of the same job, having just a, a stat line that survives in interaction with Pilot Shredder. Yeah. Whenever we are going to see that spell powered Shredder, the spell powered uh, backstab, sorry, into the Shredder. Yeah, give Shredder's spell power, Callum. That's what we need. Yeah. Just just for this last period before we lose them from the game. Just give no, them no, spell that's, power. No, uh, that's what's happening in the new expansion. You're going to uh, get Magical Shredder. Ah, uh, okay. It's going to just be Pilot Shredder, but with spell power. It's not broken at all. And the Armorsmith lined up pretty perfectly with the Shredder there for for Ryzen. Keeps his Shredder uh, a, decent, a decently high health. And actually, potentially works out in his favor, I mean, you know, we're talking about the spell damage backstab combo, actually manages to avoid that spell damage backstab combo by virtue of having damaged his pilot shredder. Mm. Oh, very true. Uh, looks like the is going to come down here on the Azure Drake. And apparently we only want 1-1-1 one, one, one on the board. Is there a reason for that? No. Um, yeah. Uh, Orange is just shaking his head there. I think he understands that. Just a bit of a brain fart there. No real reason for what he's doing, as far as I can see. Just misses out on a 1 1. Means like the only 1 1 on the board now is just a nice target for the dagger if he wants to go that way. But he might also end up using the dagger on the um, uh, Violet Teacher alongside the Eviscerate here. But just gonna go ahead and sap it. Dagger down the 1 1. Seems like a solid play, too. Just consolidates his board yet again with a Shredder, and yeah, this is kind of what we've seen, the pattern of the game that's developed. Orange with that early prep sprint has had the resource advantage, but Ryzen's found himself ahead on tempo on every turn. Yeah, so one of those examples of how card advantage doesn't just dictate how a game goes in Hearthstone. Right. It's uh, one, of, one of Trump's early basic lessons, I think, but uh, it does have to be taken in context of games. Yeah, early on in Hearthstone, card advantage was a much bigger thing than uh, than it is now, and the game's become a lot more tempo focused. But it's it's definitely a holdout from, from other CCGs and PCGs where card advantage is a much bigger deal because cards, on average, have more an effect more of an effect by being in your hand. Yeah, you know, more cards have initiative effects, um, your know, haste effects, charge effects, etc. That that do something when they first come on the board. So in a lot of CCGs, having a bunch of cards in your hand is really good because they act very quickly, mm -hmm. whereas in Hearthstone, most things are just minions, they take a turn to develop, they're a bit slow, so you want to have that that consolidated board presence and be ahead on tempo more often. Yeah, and particularly in a deck like Rogue, you have a lot of cards which don't necessarily represent, uh, if it makes sense, almost a whole card in themselves, something like yeah. Prep. Yeah. Prep isn't really a card in your hand, it's a, a card you can only play with other stuff. Yeah, it's it's a card that's only for tempo, really. Like, you're always gonna... It's never gonna be a value prep, right? Like, you're always gonna pretty much two-for-one yourself when you use prep a lot of the time. Unless it's on a Blade Flurry or something crazy like that. So, it's a card that does lower your resources in order to gain tempo. So. Well, we see Ryzen here setting up a lethal for himself with that dagger. There's an Eviscerate in hand as well. Mm -hmm. This is looking really good for Ryzen here, and I don't think there's any way for Orange to get himself out of this. No Belcher in hand, no healing. 
Yep, only has the Lotheb, but the Lotheb not going to get the job done because it would prevent the Eviscerate from being comboed, but the Dagger Charge being up as well means that there's already going to be enough damage on the board. So. Wow, it's, I mean, we said this in our first game that we've seen a, a step change from yesterday where we had these long, ponderous matchups, these really intricate, detailed back and forths, but we're seeing a second dominant performance here for Ryzen on the Rogue, which, as you've said, is one of his favorite decks, probably the deck he's strongest with. Yeah. Uh, potentially on for a 3-0 here and again this is the same situation we saw with Kranich into Sixo where uh Kranich put himself in a mirror match not favoring his third deck against what Sixo was playing and now Orange finds himself in that same situation not going for the mirror match picking it rather than his third deck and then having to play that third deck anyway right there is still time for orange to come back into this but obviously he's in a very unfavorable proposition he he favored going with the mirror match there as you said and and didn't come out uh didn't come out with a favorable result so he now has to queue up the warrior that he didn't want to queue up previously but um he's gonna have to just cross his fingers and hope that this warrior can complete the three zero sweep now how much how, what would you say his uh his chances are of completing that sweep with the uh, if he goes through the rogue, he has to deal with a druid and a paladin. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, there's no blowout matches here, unless this is Control Warrior from Orange, but I don't believe it was, right? Was he playing Patron Yes. I think it was Patron. So if it's Patron, he has a, a slightly favorable matchup against the druid and a, a reasonably favorable matchup against the paladin. He's, he's pretty heavily favored against the paladin and can squeak out the druid in terms of win rate as well. So he has three matchups that he's, he's not really hugely unfavored in any of them, but the mere fact that he has to win three in a row means that he is um, below 50% percentage to win this game. All right, well, we'll see. Obviously, it is going to be the warrior for Orange, which uh, we're pretty confident was the patron warrior from yesterday against the rogue of Ryzen. And if Ryzen's able to win this and advance to the semi-final, what a story this has been for him, particularly doing so from the, the round of eight with his favorite deck. Uh, a player that ne people wouldn't have necessarily taken that seriously coming into this tournament. A lot of people were looking at the player list and looking at Ryzen and, and his teammate, the Jordan, and thinking, you know, well, these aren't guys I would expect to see in this kind of tournament mm. that's so stacked, but really making a statement here. Yeah, I mean, Super JJ is the complexity player that's got all the exposure recently, and for good reason. He's just. You say that so, some complexity players have appeared on the uh, Hearthstone Championship Tour broadcasts. Okay. All right. Okay. Super JJ is the complexity player that has received exposure as a competitive player recently, um, and for good reason because you know he's just been steamrolling pretty much every tournament he's been involved with. You know, either winning top four, you know, over and over again, but. Um, we think we have a very strong lineup. We're, uh, we have a lot of faith in all of our players, and this was a chance for Ryzen and the Jordu to really rise up and, and show their potential. And Ryzen is making a pretty good showing of that right now. Did you really just say that it's a chance for Ryzen to rise up? I did, yeah. Yeah, great job. Did you like that? Nice advert for the team as well. Thank you. We, I mean, you, you set me up for it, so why not, yeah. right? Yeah, it's good. Well, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of complexity. I mean, Complexity have a history of bringing through players and them going on to, to achieve great things. Guys like Show and Dog, yep. who've got started in Complexity and gone on to be on major teams and, and really achieve great things. So right. these this could be the next generation of, of Shows and Dogs. Yeah. Why not? I mean, Ryzen has a great opportunity to, to start oh, that huge... No. That, that start off a reputation as not only a very, very entertaining streamer, but obviously a high-level competitive player as well. Absolutely. So let's look at the hand here from Orange. What does he have? He does have the Patron, a Slam, Double Inner Rage, one Death by itself. Seems to be a lot of tools in the hand here. Yeah. This looks like this looks very much like we're going to see an early Patron kind of game here. Um, just go all in as early as possible. Hope that the Blade Flurry hasn't been drawn yet. And if there is no Blade Flurry against that board of four patrons, then it's going to be too much of an advantage. Uh, Death Spite is very much the key card in this matchup overall, though. Not only because it can it set up all your patron turns and get the party started, but it's also just such an effective answer. In this kind of situation, you coin it out on turn three, snipe down their first minion, and then if there's a Violet Teacher follow-up, then you basically shut that down. You essentially make Violet Teacher unplayable in this situation. Um, but luckily, it's the Shredder and not the Violet Teacher that was drawn from Ryzen. Straight away, Orange is going to the Slam here because he has the Slam and the Cruel Taskmaster. Right. And if it's something really scary, he can use the Death Sprite. But... Oh, he's not using that Death Sprite. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if that was Millhouse Mana Storm. He would, <laughs> he would have tanked the four damage from it this turn. The reason for the Slam Cruel Taskmaster is purely because he didn't want to use the Death Sprite this turn. Yeah. 
So what can Ryzen do to respond to this here? I think, does it telegraph that he has the patron setting up the fight here? It, I mean, he had a nice answer to the first half of Shredder, but the fact that you don't swing gives it away a little bit, but in general, Patron Warrior wants to get some sort of value from that second swing death fight, whether it's an Acolyte, a Battle Rage, or a Patron. So it telegraphs that you have something to do with it, not necessarily the full god draw for Patrons on turn 5, but Ryzen would have been expecting something scary to happen this turn. Do you go for the full 6 Patrons here, or just the 4? Um, I think I'm okay with just the four. You have that Grom in your hand that has the value with the inner rage. You've already just used a Taskmaster as well in terms of the really um, effective in range effects. Um, and just having that inner rage for a second patron if and when you draw it is strong as well because you know, I kind of just feel like this dies to Blade Flurry just the same. So, mm. yeah. Well, we'll see if it pays off for Orange. We did mention, you mentioned the Violet Teacher and how you can clear up the aspect of that where Sludge Belcher lines up uh, in the same sort of way. Yeah. Be able to deal with hey! it. Oh, the <laughs> punish! Oh, punish him! Um, Let's look at Orange's face here and see what he thinks of that. Oh, yeah. It's not been Orange's day, really. Not, no. Um, but yeah, let's let's evaluate the decision to use the second inner rage. So if he'd have just used one inner rage, he would have had a five-one patron, a three-two patron, and two three-three patrons. Which means the 5 1 at the 3 2 would have immediately been traded off by the minions that were left on the board. And you're asking for two answers from the road. So, Deadly Poison Eviscerate would have done it, for example. Um, so, you're not necessarily demanding exactly Blade Flurry in that situation. So, I guess when you break it down like that and evaluate it, it's probably not too bad for Orange to push all in in that situation. Yeah, as you say, it does demand exactly Blade Flurry or some other you know, very involved way of dealing with it rather than yeah. just two standalone answers. Yeah. This is interesting here. How does Ryzen want to deal with the minions on the board? He does have the power to do it, but he would lose everything except the Edwin. Uh, well, unless he wants to send the Edwin and waste the damage, and then he gets to keep more of a board presence. Right, yeah. He can send the Edwin into the Unstable Ghoul, lose that six damage from going face, but keep more of a solid board. Um, I think that's probably the line he'll take. It feels bad, but having just dealt with the first wave of patrons and having all these cards in your hand, um, I probably imagine he's not feeling too greedy. And I, I might even like to see him clear the Armorsmith here to play around Battle Rage. Yeah, I love this. I love this. Yeah, so this, this was the line I was thinking because of clearing both minions. Yeah. Could you not have uh, trying to think? Could you not have cleared the Armorsmith with the Van Cleef instead? If you'd done it that way around, would the Mech Warper no. have lived? No, it's the same thing. Yeah. Okay. It's the same thing, and uh, you'd attack into the Ghoul twice as well, so there would be an extra arm. No, because you end up to no. It's exactly the same thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, Van Rage into Shredder. That's not bad. It does directly challenge the the health of this Van Cleef. Just the single battle rage for orange. But yeah, things are looking a little bad from here, and that sap in the hand of Ryzen is going to be really useful for him to disrupt any tempo that orange threatens to get. And actually, he's going to save the shredder, use the war axe and the whirlwind here. Wow. What do you I think of that? I mean, I guess he's just worried about the tempo loss of, you know, if you play shredder and it's able to be dealt with by a sap or some sort of deadly poison plus backstab answer. Um, and he's just in back in the same position where that 6-4 Edwin is beating him in the face. So, um, yeah, I, I like the line. Well, there's a Violet Teacher pickup, which is pretty nice for Ryzen behind this Sludge Belcher, I think. Especially having Dean dealt with the first wave of patrons already. You maybe feel a little bit better about potentially building up a board of Violet Teacher tokens. Yeah. Um, especially, like, building a board of teacher tokens preemptively before a patron board is fine, because most of the time they're going to have to whirlwind to generate patrons anyway, so they'll be cleared off the board. So how many of these spells are we going to see played here? Uh, Prep Fan and Sap are being used almost certainly. Uh, I don't think he's going to want to eviscerate that. He'll probably save the eviscerate for face damage at this point, just send it back to the hand with Sap. It has to kind of contest with that one-two slime right now anyway, so it's not a big deal if it's charged from hand. And uh, that'll probably be his lot. He can he can hold on to the rest for now. Yep, just uses to equip the dagger as well, which gives him the utility of doing things with the dagger on the next turn. Always good to try and equip a dagger 
going into every turn if it's all possible as the rogue. Yeah. Just to save yourself any mana you might need to do things with oils and blade flurries. But yeah. Orange is going to set up the Acolyte and potentially a Grom with the best fight here, but how much damage is there on board? 6, 7, 12. 4 from the. Yeah. 12 so with spell power abyss. Uh, Lower Feb should more or less lock it down here, though. Yeah, I mean, I, I said earlier I don't want to jinx it, but I feel like we are now heading for our second 3 0 after going a full day, eight matches with no 3 0s. Is he even going to sap the Acolyte? And why not? He understands that the game ends next turn, so use all the resources you have available to you to make the game end next turn. Yeah. Um, I love this sap. Just pushes the maximum damage here, and he knows that this Lothar should just represent the end of the game. Yeah, just deny any extra potential card draw from Orange that might somehow get him some magical out, like he happens to be playing Brawl in his patron. Don't let him dig any deeper for that. <laughs> yeah, right. Not that it would matter because, you know, Lothep, but... Yeah, Brawl would cost 10 mana, he couldn't even armor, so he'd still be dead even in that world. But like you say, like, just in case there's some sort of crazy scenario you haven't considered, you know the game is over, so you might as well get it done. Yep, Orange is able to clear the board here using the Grom, but unfortunately, the Eviscerate doesn't even need the token, but that is going to be enough. And Ryzen, really good after that victory, a 3-0 win over Orange. Really impressive for Ryzen. Of course, taking the our, one of our only two 3-1s as well uh, over Show in, our third, in our, sec our third match of the day yesterday. So Ryzen is going to advance to our semi-final to play 6-0. Yep. Uh, super impressive performance from Ryzen. Yeah, it really is. I mean, some of you guys might not know him as a, as a top caliber player, but you know, I've, I've worked with him in, in Complexity now for a few months. I know that he's a, a very, very solid player indeed. No surprise to me to see him doing well in this tournament, but definitely not one of the names that people would have picked out as someone to be fairly dominant in the bracket so far. Like you said, 3-1, 3-0 is uh, pretty impressive these days uh, within the land of 3-2s that we had in the first round. Yeah, one of the only players so far to not have to play uh, all of his decks. Yeah. Potentially, yeah. I don't. I, did we see the? We saw the rogue from him yesterday. I believe we saw I rogue believe. and druid from him yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. So we've we we still haven't seen his paladin or his warrior. Yeah. Which is uh, it's really interesting to see mm -hmm. if he's going to be able to conceal that information a little bit longer. The more the longer you can conceal information, the better, right? Absolutely. Last Hero Standing is a format where the onus is on you to conceal information. The better your win rate is as you go through the tournament, the more information you conceal. Whereas Conquest by Nature, as soon as you've played one round, all your decks are out there. So, Or you've lost. Or you're out the tournament. <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah. Only two options. Yeah. Well, guys, I do have some bad news, unfortunately. We're gonna have, we have a change to the schedule. Oh, no. and, uh, you know, I know we said we would bring you Life Coach versus Firebat later on, but unfortunately... We're gonna have to bring it to you now. Oh, damn uh, it. oh I know. Just messing Ow. with everyone's plans. But yeah, that's so our next quarterfinal is gonna be the quarterfinal number four, Life Coach versus Firebat. Uh we're gonna go to quick break in just a few minutes. But so what a match that is gonna be. A final anywhere in the world. Yeah. A final in any tournament in the world. Yeah, I think uh, looking at this top eight at the start of the day, you know, we said earlier we both picked out the the six o versus Kranich. We like the winner of that to go on and progress really far. But if you were looking at like, say, who was going to meet them in the bottom half of the bracket, who was going to meet them in the final, you'd be looking at this game to say, okay, the winner of this game is in a really good position to push through as well. Well, absolutely. And you know, we said we said that Ryzen having beaten two established players. Maybe it could be anyone in six, so a very strong player. But if you can be either Life Coach or Firebat, you're, uh, you, you've got to be favorite to take on just about anyone. Yeah. Of course, Holly and Zelay in our third quarterfinal as well. Uh, not to be discounted, Zelay with a strong win over Dog yesterday, who was your pick to win the whole thing early on, so. Yeah, Dog was, uh, I stopped my neck out on the line, you know, took a shot in the dark out of 16 quality players, and Dog was the guy that I picked out. Didn't end up panning out that way, but... Congrats to Zelay for progressing through. Zelay is a very, very strong player in his own right. But Dog's someone who I'm a, a big fan of. I watch a lot of his stream as well. So more of a, uh, a hopeful pick, shall we say, than anything that was built on any data. But yeah, as you said, the remaining two quarterfinals, Zelay versus Hoy and Life Coach versus Firebat, are both of a very high level. But I'm very excited to be able to bring you Life Coach versus Firebat after a very short break.
Absolutely. We talked about Hoy uh, as well being in the match against the Lee that quarterfinal. I would say Hoy, who, you know, he's a player we're, we're both quite familiar with, we know yeah. quite well, uh, and are both big fans of, but, I, you know, I, I, I say I say this with all the love in the world for Hoy as a player. Mm -hmm. I don't think we saw him at his best yesterday. So there's a thing with Hoy. Um, I remember there was a an article that I was a part of for a while where they pulled a... Um, a panel of community members to pick out the top 10 players in Hearthstone. And originally, I left Hoy off my long list that I submitted for that article. And then luckily, he got enough nominations from other people to find his way in. And then during that period, I went to um, DreamHack Winter and hung out with Hoy a lot and got to like watch his play up close and personal a lot more. And there's a lot of stuff that Hoy does um, that isn't necessarily optimal Hearthstone. And it looks weird. And it's because... Hoy is doing these things outside of the game. Um, you know, I've seen him like deliberately not um, develop minions to represent the threat of Death Spite. Um, just to, to, to see it, his opponent just slowed down because he respected Death Spite based on his play. He just didn't have Death Spite in hand. And it's a really hard play to identify that that's what he's doing. Um, but when you really break it down and you talk to him and you ask him what the mentality was, he has a lot of these outside the box plays that make a lot of sense. Um, so when you say, you know, we didn't really see Hoy at his best, it's not necessarily that you know, he wasn't playing optimally. That's very much Hoy's style. He has his own style that he tries to impose on the game. But um, he did enough to get through three games to two. That's the important thing. He's still here. He's still in the tournament. But he's going to have another huge challenge now up against the lane. Absolutely. It's such a stacked top eight here in the Wombology tournament. I still can't believe how good a quality of players we have in this main event of course the quality of players in our side event is really high as well yeah which is going on right now we're going to bring you the final of that later on but players like uh aka wonder vortex indirin green sheep chandyland are in the top eight of that they're playing for a thousand dollar prize pool and of course you can go and play for prize money on womble.gg womble.gg i've been told to make sure i say that properly so it doesn't sound like womble yeah which if you're a fan of uh early 90s British children's television. Which of uh, course everyone is, right? Yes. Yeah. You will of course recognize Wombology as the practice of making you the use of the things that we find. Yeah. But uh, it's Wombo.gg. You can play money matches against your friends, against pros, in all manner of esports games. What was that, Sultan? It still sounded like Wombo. Wombo <laughs> dot gg. Apparently it's not a sound that the, the Scottish dialect can make, Callum. Yeah. Well, you're the one that kept telling me we had to call this tournament Woomology, so <laughs> you could just buy out of this one. Of course, right. this tournament is also sponsored by Shoe, ScreenShoe.com, a fun way to screenshot your game and share it with your friends. Check that out today. Of course, myself, Calm, and Soto are going to be here with you the rest of the day, bringing you all these matches. There's a lot of exciting Hearthstone yet to come. These three O's that we're seeing here, Soto, you know, I, I feel like I did somewhat jinx it at the start of the day talking about how we hadn't had any three zeros yeah. uh, and particularly the druid three zero which is reminiscent of a number a lot of games that we've seen uh in years gone by in last year's standing do, do you think that is necessarily a negative part of the uh of the format it's it's a part of the format it's one of the threats of last hero standing it's one of the big reasons why last hero standing was moved away from in the first place um, the chance for a dominant deck to go 3-0 and make a lot of the series, you know, kind of one-sided and uninteresting. So we saw it with Druid early on, which is definitely considered a very dominant deck at the moment. And then we saw it in that Ryzen series as well. Rogue, not a dominant deck, but Ryzen, a dominant player with Rogue. Um, so that's the potential of Last Hero Standing to snowball into these 3-0 situations. But it's not necessarily a downside of the format. It just kind of opens up the ability for, you know, if, if a player has mastered a particular deck, then good job the format rewards you for that you know you can have your own opinions on whether that's a good thing or a bad thing absolutely well we're going to go to a quick break now and when we come back it's going to be our next quarter final matchup life coach versus firebat two of the most decorated players the most highest earning players last year in hearthstone two of the absolute titans of the game are going to clash here in wombology don't go anywhere you're watching wombology with calman soto on twitch